Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 10, and just before I read God's word, I'm going to pray again. Our Lord in heaven, we uh, pray that you would help us now. Lord, there have been a number of changes this week for our church and churches, moving locations, and uh, there are a number of changes, Lord, in all of our lives that many of us do not know about. And sometimes these things get on top of us and they distract us. But Lord, as this is the moment that you have gathered us together to speak to us, we pray, Lord, that you would speak and that you would work through all of our weaknesses to help us, that we would hear your word and that we would benefit from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give his aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted He is able to aid those who are tempted. Amen. Amen. Well, remember that I said that the direction of our travel in the book of Hebrews now is towards chapter 3 and verse 6, that we are to hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are to be faithful to the Lord. And we began asking the question, why should we be faithful to the Lord last time? And we said that God has appointed to man glory and honor in setting him above all of creation, and yet we threw it away. But Jesus has regained the creation in order to restore it to us. And the question that follows on from this is how do we arrive at the glory that God has prepared for us. And the answer is given in verse 10. It was fitting for him and for whom are all, um, fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So how are we led to glory? Well, God is leading us to glory through the captain of our salvation, but there is a problem depending on how you look at it, it's a problem. The captain of our salvation, who leads us to glory, did so through sufferings. And for many people, that is a barrier. To consider a leader who leads us on to a humiliating death on the cross is not the kind of leader that we would ordinarily choose to follow, especially if we as his disciples have to follow him in his humiliation and in his death. And for many of the Christians that the author to the Hebrews writes to, this is a serious temptation. That as they bear the weight of the cross themselves, there is a temptation to exchange the shame of the cross 
for the outward splendor of the temple, for that which is socially acceptable, that which the community would approve of. And for you, when you have followed Christ and taken up the cross, there is a shame associated with the cross of Christ, and there is a temptation for you to exchange that shame for something that will be acceptable in society's eyes. Are you ashamed of the morals of Christianity in a world that is increasingly immoral? Are you ashamed of the truths of Christianity, though the whole world denounces them as falsehoods? The virgin birth, the resurrection, a historic Adam and Eve. Are you ashamed of the message that we are to take to the nations that seems outdated and offensive? That men are sinners and must repent in order to find salvation with God? Are you ashamed of the humiliation of the church that our outward form is not glorious like the great corporations of the earth, and we might wish that it was. And in all of this shame, the temptation for us is to desire to exchange that shame, the shame of the cross, for something that the world will accept. But the message is this, that you should never be ashamed of suffering. For suffering is the path to glory. It is through Christ's sufferings that we are led to glory. And it is through our own following of Christ in a path that is laden with sufferings that we will arrive at glory. Never be ashamed of the cross and of the suffering that is associated with it. I'm going to give you three reasons why we should not despise suffering. Four reasons. The first is that through suffering, Jesus stood with you. Verse 11 tells us, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now, the other way of saying that is that he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified must be of one. That is, of one nature and of one heart. This is the example of the Old Testament priesthood in chapter 5 and verse 1. The high priests were taken from among men in order that they might act for men, in order that they might bring gifts and sacrifices for sin. And part of the reason for this was that they themselves, having the same nature of those they represented of, could not only act for man, but also have compassion on those they serve. They would understand the weaknesses of man, the limitations of man. And it's a bit like this. If you are going to climb a mountain, say you're going to tackle Mount Everest, you don't want to be led up the mountain by a mountain goat because the mountain goat is going to walk on paths that you cannot walk upon. You don't want to be led up the mountain by a robot because the robot doesn't feel the the weaknesses of human flesh and he'll take you into extreme conditions that you cannot endure. If you're to be led into glory, you need to be led by one who is like you and one who is committed to you. And that's what the author says in verse 17, therefore, right? If we are to have a high priest like the high priests of the Old Testament, He had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a faithful, a merciful and faithful high priest. In all things, he had to be made like his brethren. In order for the Son of God to act on our behalf, he had to take to himself true flesh and true blood, true weaknesses, your weaknesses. And thankfully, this was the messianic anticipation In verse 12, he says, and we sang before from Psalm 22, that the one who declares victory to the people of God having first suffered is the one who calls us his brothers. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will will praise you. He's the one who calls us his brothers, and he is the one who is part of the assembly. He's part of the gathering of the people of God. He is one like them. He is one who, as we trust in God, would also himself first trust in God, just like we have to. Again, I will put my trust in him. Verse 13, 
As Isaiah the prophet trusted in the Lord amidst an unfaithful generation, the Son of God comes and he trusts in the Lord just as you have to trust in the Lord and he knows how hard that is. And again, he goes on to say, his association with the people would be so close that he would consider you his own flesh and blood. Here am I, he says, and the children whom God has given me. That's the nearness that the Messiah would feel to his people. That's the closeness of the bond. That is the unity of the nature that we are to expect from our Savior. And yet, how could the Son, the one that we have been considering, the one through whom all things have been made and for whom are all things made, the one who is the brightness of the very essence of God, the one who blinds the seraphim so that they have to cover their eyes. How could he be made like you? It is an unthinkable thought. If you weren't familiar with the Christian message, you could never ever imagine or conceive that the one who made time and space would become one creature on earth. And yet that is exactly what he has done. Verse 14 tells us, and as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. In order to dwell amongst us, he became one of us. In order to act as your high priest, to sympathize with you, he took your weaknesses, your limitations to himself, the one who was infinite, the one who was not bound in any sense, became bound in the prison house of a human body. And the great declaration of this fact and the extent of his commitment to you is seen in his sufferings. The sufferings that are mentioned in verse 10. For it is only a true man that can suffer and die. In those sufferings, you see that not only is he as a true man, but he is one who is truly committed to you. And though it meant indescribable shame, for the one who is the author of life to experience and taste death, he was not ashamed, verse 11, to call you his brothers. He was pleased to live as a man, to die as a man in association with you, to stand with you. His incarnation is displayed to us in its greatest glory in his suffering and his death. It is through his suffering that you know that Jesus stands with you. It's also through his suffering that Jesus has freed you. Now, you might not realize that you need freeing, but God says that through his death, verse 15, he has released those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Death hangs over mankind like some inescapable enemy. The fear of the unknown. For some, it's the fear of knowing exactly what is to come the judgment of God and giving an account of their lives to him. And that fear of death dictates the behavior of man. It is because of the fear of death that man uh, grasps the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, because he believes this is the only life he has. It's the fear of death that governs all of our choices. Our politics, our individual choices are governed by the simple motivation to avoid death, to preserve life, to stay alive. Everything is governed by this fear of death. The fear of death allows tyrants to rule on the earth. The only reason tyrants exist is because they can threaten to cause people to suffer and cause people to die. Death controls, death enslaves man. And the purveyor of death is the devil. He is the one who led us from a condition of life into a condition of sin and death in the garden. He is the one who takes advantage of the fear of death 
and reigns through our fear to control us and to have us to act on his behalf and to do his bidding. It is the devil who delights in death, and it is the devil who accuses you to your death. But Jesus, as the one who is made like you in every way, has freed you from the power of death and has disarmed the devil. Verse 14, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. He doesn't just become like you to associate with you. He becomes like you to act for you. And in his death, he has destroyed the power of death. And he has disarmed then. He has neutered the devil in all of his venom, in all of, all of his violence that he can do towards your soul. In every accusation that the devil could ever make against you, he, in taking your place, took those accusations to himself. He took your sin to himself and so silenced the devil. And all of the consequences of the devil's accusations against you, that you deserved death and eternal judgment, he, in his humanity, took them to himself. When he suffered death, he brought an end to death for you. So that through faith, the Christian doesn't die, but sleeps, awaiting the resurrection. And therefore, we are set free from the fear and the finality of death. And we are able to live, not grasping after the pleasures of this world, but to live in the freedom of the next world. Not chasing every indulgence of the flesh, but living unto righteousness, knowing the righteousness that awaits us in glory. And this was through suffering. The suffering and shame of the cross that we might despise is the very suffering that has freed you from the power of the devil. Through sufferings, Jesus stood with you. Through sufferings, Jesus has freed you. Through sufferings, thirdly, Jesus has reconciled you. Verse 17, therefore, in all these things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He has not just become you in order to act as you, to free you from the dominion of the devil, to deliver you from death, but he has become a high priest who is compassionate to you and is able faithfully to fulfill his calling and things pertaining to God to do something very important, to provide propitiation for the sins of his people. The devil is the great enslaver of man and the accuser, but God is the moral judge. The world that we live in is his world, and it is governed by his standard. That standard summarized in the moral law that we read together and we confess together, and his standard is good. I've said it before, but you imagine a world where everybody obeys the Ten Commandments. It would be a perfect world, a world of righteousness, a world of love, a world of mercy, if we could only do that, but we don't. And it is sin, and it is our sin, and it is your sin that has corrupted this world that was designed to display the beauty of God. It is my sin, and it is your sin that has acted uh, in ways that have corrupted the image of God in man. The creation designed to show his beauty and his glory. Man designed to reflect his likeness on the earth. But we have chosen, chosen sin instead. We have chosen to go our way. We have chosen to rebel against God. We have chosen to turn his morality upside down. What will God do with us? He tells us. He gives us several pictures in his word. He has prepared a place where the worm doth not die and the fire is not quenched. He has prepared a place of outer darkness 
a place of torment where there'll be no rest day or night. This is what God has prepared for the rebels who have rebelled against him. The devil is the least of your worries. It is God as judge that is the great threat and fear of man. And yet even in this, Jesus in having been made like you in every respect has made a propitiation for your sins. He has taken the debt that is owed to God upon himself and the debt has been cleared. He has appeased the great wrath of God. And in offering up his life as a sweet-smelling and soothing aroma, he has, to speak poetically, put God at rest. And he has brought peace between God and man and so secured the eternal mercy of the Lord. And he did it how? Through sufferings. Through sufferings, Jesus stood with you. Through sufferings, Jesus freed you. Through sufferings, Jesus reconciled you. And fourthly, through sufferings, Jesus helps you. There is a unique privilege that is given to man above all of the angels. We're told in verse 16, indeed, he does not give his aid to angels, but he does give his aid to the seed of Abraham. Of course, he sustains the lives of his angels. Of course, he does help his angels in various ways. But there is something very special and very unique about the help that he gives to the seed of Abraham, to those who have believed in Jesus Christ by faith. And the word that is given to us here as aid is the word to take or to seize or to grab hold of. He doesn't physically grab hold of the angels and become like them to deliver them from the fires of hell. But he does take hold of man by first taking humanity to himself. He then grips mankind in his arms and he endures the judgment of God and he frees from the fear of death to bring man again back into the life of God and into the presence of God. This is what God has done. He doesn't give aid to angels, but he does give aid to man. We were like children wandering towards the edge of a great cliffside. But he grabbed you and he set you on the path home. And he is leading you on the path home. And he says, follow me on that path home. And yet at times, that seems an impossible thing to do. The journey for us is long and hard. And we are assailed at every point by discouragements and by much opposition. But notice what it says in verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. More than having freed you from the evil one, associating with you and reconciling you to God, having suffered for faithfulness to God, he knows exactly what you're going through as you seek to be faithful to God. He knows the betrayal of close friends, of family members of the nation. He knows many enemies, all those who plotted his death throughout his life. He knows tiredness. And he knows disappointments. How many times he, having labored, hoped to see a great number that would follow him and be faithful to him to the end. And yet where, where were they? They left him, the crowds first, and his disciples also in his hour of need. 
Do you think you've been discouraged in ways unique to you? No. All of your discouragements, the Lord knows. Everything that God asks of you, you feel you just don't have the strength and you're weary. Imagine how it was for the Son of God. You're from the breaking of dawn till the setting of the sun. He was laboring for his Father's glory. And whenever he sought to take a little bit of rest, it was interrupted. He knows exactly the struggle of faithfulness. And now in heaven, knowing that he's interceding for you. Remember when he said to Peter in Luke 22 in verse 31, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. He knows the onslaught against faith in striving to be faithful to God. And so he knows exactly where you need the help. And he prays that your faith would not fail. In the great high priestly prayer, he prayed to his father, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. He was praying that you would attain to the glory He was praying that you would be there with him. And he now, having ascended into heaven, having suffered for faithfulness to God, is able to help you. Now he is interceding that you would not fail. He knows your limitations. He knows your weaknesses. And he is working for you. He not only knows them, but he shows you also what spirit-filled humanity can do. Going back to the beginning, if you're climbing a great mountain, we said you don't want to follow a mountain goat because you can't walk where the mountain goat walks. And you don't want to follow a robot because it doesn't feel what you will feel in your flesh. But you know what? Everywhere that he has gone, you can go. Everything that you feel he has felt, he knows exactly what it is like. But he shows to you by his example what a life anointed with the Spirit of God is able to accomplish. Because he has gone before you and finished that race, so you can follow him and be assured that you too will finish that race. When the doubts enter your mind and when the devil seeks to distract you, remember this. Jesus has gone before you, a true man in the Spirit. And so you as true men and women of God in the Spirit, can go where he has gone, can ascend the mountain of God, and will one day arrive at the glory that he has prepared for you. And these helps that he affords to us come about how? What does it say in verse 18? Through his sufferings. Now here's the main point of the whole sermon. If through the shadow, shame, and contempt of the cross, he has stood with you, he has freed you, he has reconciled you, he has learned how to help you, how could you ever then distance yourself from him or the shame that his cross brings into your life? Yes, there are pressures associated with being a Christian. Yes, the world will despise and reject you, but remember this. He was not ashamed to call you his brothers. Do not be ashamed to call him your brother. Be bold in faithfulness to God. Be faithful to the truth of God. Be faithful to the morals of God. Be faithful to the mission of God. Be faithful to the church of God. No matter what it costs, he was not ashamed to call you his brothers. You should not be ashamed to call him yours. Though you may feel the whole world has set its face against you, remember it did to him. The great opposition, the struggle you feel is nothing but a confirmation that you have taken up his cross and that you were on the pathway to glory. 
And above all, know this. He alone is the one that leads to glory. The great glory that we spelled out in the last sermon, God is bringing many sons to glory through the leading of the captain of their salvation, through his suffering. He despised the shame, endured the cross, and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And so follow him with all your might, with all faith, with all strength of the Spirit, despising the shame that his cross brings into your life, looking to the joy that is before you. And I can guarantee that if you do that, you will one day arrive at the glory that he has prepared. He is leading you on to glory through his sufferings and through your own. Amen.